Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the final session. As I mentioned, um, uh, I am going to kick off our discussion about running high-level um, uh, frameworks for machine learning workloads like PyTorch in Gem5. Uh, and this is uh, between Vishnu, Matt Premba, and myself. We're each going to take a piece of, of this discussion. So you know, a couple of disclaimers up front. Right now, Gem5 only supports AMD GPU ISAs. Uh, it also technically supports ARM. GPUs were not going to arms. GPUs are not integrated with these high level frameworks. So while it's there, I just want to mention that the concepts for other GPUs like NVIDIA though are similar. Um, and currently gem five only runs GP GPU workloads. So there's no Vulkan or open GL support. Um, so we're focusing, you know, more squarely on HPC, machine learning, scientific computing, graph analytics. Those are the kind of workloads that we're running in, in gem five with the GPU model today. Uh, and, you know, well, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, are you showing slides? Yeah, we see them in the room. Do you not see them? I do not. Could you share your screen? Uh, okay. Let me. Okay. Do you see it now, Jason? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that for those watching the recording later. Um, you know, just to mention uh, where I was though, you know, ultimately the work being done to support GPUs in Gem5 has been done by a whole lot of people. Uh, Matt, P, myself, and Vishnu are three of those people. But I do want to mention all the other names you see on this screen are people who've also invested time and resources trying to, to make these models more usable and uh, more supported and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, as as the as a, you know, I can say now that I'm getting old. Back in the day when when I was starting undergrad, GPUs were, you know, just becoming, you know, hot, just becoming a thing even really. Uh and you'll probably hear, you know, when may talk about this on Tuesday when he gets his uh Mockerdeckley award uh, uh during the award lunch, but you know, as the slide shows, you know, he was one of the first folks in academia who noticed this revolution that was coming and had done a lot a lot of work that's now helping him earn this award he's getting uh in making general purpose gpus more widely usable and possible and at the time these numbers of course will look tiny compared to the ones that modern gpus have but at the time they were being looked at as something that could run a high performance computing and scientific computing uh, because they were offering a large number of flops compared to CPUs, which is the blue line, the green line here being GPUs. And you can see that it was just dwarfing the flops that are available on CPUs. Um, but at the time, we didn't really have a good way to program them. And the advent of CUDA and later HIP, which we'll talk about today, were game changers there. Uh, also a game changer was the fact that there was a killer app for a GPU, graphics, you know, for gaming, and this meant that, um, you know, arguably there was already a GPU in every desktop, laptop, mobile device, and so on, that could also, on the side, if you will, at the time, be used for general purpose GPU computing. Note, at this time, machine learning was not the primary use of GPUs, which is not true anymore, right? Nowadays, it's, the GPU has gone from originally being used to graphics to being used primarily for high performance and scientific computing and graphics to now being primarily used for machine learning. Of course, there's other things like crypto that uh, recently, you know, uh, GPU companies have made a nice bit of coin off of, uh, you know, selling their, their devices to and making it very hard for us academics to get access to. Um, so, you know, there are other workloads besides machine learning that are widely using GPUs, but I, I do want to just give a disclaimer that we're not really going to talk about how to run those. So, you know, this talk will not teach you how to run crypto in, in Gem5. If one of you want to do that and contribute it back to the community, you know, more, more power to you, but I will not be investing any of my uh, resources in doing that. Um, although it has come up once or twice that, you know, the, that workload would be an interesting one that to, to answer some of the research questions we're doing. Um, ultimately, by the end of this session of the tutorial, what the what we're hoping you'll take from it is that you'll be able to understand the basics of the GPU architecture, how AMD GPUs are implemented in Gem5. Uh, we're going to skip over the compiling Gem5 model because 
uh, we saw in the last part that that took really long. So we're just going to show you how you would compile it and then not compile it at all uh, and move forward to the using the pre-built ones, um, identifying resources that are available, and then running tests in both SE and FS mode, including checkpointing and restoring applications in FS mode and offloading certain computations to uh, the CPU in FS mode, which implicitly what that means is we're going to have you run some tests in PyTorch in Gem5, and we're going to show you for some simple, small examples what you would get from that so that hopefully when you go back to your various universities or places of work, you'll be able to take this exact same support because it's all in the public code and uh, run whatever workloads you're interested in. All right. So in terms of outline, what does that mean? Well, it means after I go through, I'm going to go through some background information here, and then Matt P and Vishnu are going to go through the, the actual fun stuff. How do we model and use and run stuff in Gem5? For those of you who aren't familiar, I think it's really instructive to think about Flynn's taxonomy. And for those of you who don't know what Flynn's taxonomy is, he, uh, Flynn came up with a way to classify how programs behave on hardware. Um, and specifically what Flynn did is he broke it into how many instructions are you processing at once and how much data are you processing for those instructions at once. Um, and you can imagine this made a 2D grid. We have single instruction or multi-instruction and we have single data or multiple data. So arguably classic CPUs were single instruction, single data. So you were fetching one instruction, you were accessing one piece of data with that instruction and you did this many, many times. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have MIMD, which is multi-instruction, multi-data, which meant, which is something like MPI, uh, where you are fetching many instructions on, say, different processes even sometime. Um, and each of those have their own piece of data or data pieces of data they might be accessing. And we're going to use this concept to split independent work over multiple processes. And there's also a, a subcategory here, which is where MPI comes in called SPIMD or single program multiple data, where you have many processes each running the same program, but act, each process accesses independent data. Um, so in MIMD, you could have each of those processes be running something completely different. But in SPIMD, you have one program split across many processes and each of them access unique data. GPUs, uh, fall into a different category. And specifically, they're a type of data parallel workload that does independent identical computation on multiple data inputs. So if we think about Flynn's taxonomy, we can see that keyword multiple data inputs. So that tells us that the last two you know, variables are SIMD. But it also says that the computation is identical. And so the re that's why we characterize GPU computation as something like SIMD or single instruction multiple data, where we split that identical independent work over multiple execution units. And the reason why this has been so popular and powerful is it allows us to eliminate a lot of inefficiencies with general purpose processors. So we only have to fetch and decode the instruction once, unlike all of the other approaches. We also get to have a single PC and register file. So we share and amortize the space for that. And this allows SIMD to offer some significant wins over some of those other approaches. The reason I said that GPUs are kind of SIMD though, is they actually have a cousin called SIMT, which stands for single instruction multiple thread. And that is what GPUs are actually doing. And so the idea here is instead of splitting that identical independent work over multiple execution units like SIMD would, and SIMD would be like a Intel or IBM or ARM vector unit on a CPU, in SIMT, we're splitting that independent identical work over multiple threads that are executing usually in lockstep. Although in recent years, AMD and NVIDIA have introduced some ways to relax that assumption. Um, and what that means is we have a single PC for a group of threads that are executing in lockstep, but each of them are going to access essentially an independent piece of the register file. Um, and this turns out to work really well for the kinds of applications that are traditionally and currently running on GPUs. For example, streaming applications where every thread has its own set of computation and its own set of data to work on, and there's very little communication that needs to happen across threads. It turns out these kind of things, machine learning being one of them, 
are perfectly suited to running on the thousands, millions, or billions of threads that GPUs offer today. So while I just went through and told you the difference between SIMT and SIMD, I do want to point out that people use them interchangeably. If you read, if you even listen to papers here at ISCA during the week, you'll see people talk about SIMD GPUs when they really mean SIMT or vice versa. So as long as you understand that difference that one of them is on ex across execution units and one of them is across threads, um, the rest of the details are pretty similar. What does that look like though? So I think it's instructive to think about threads and how they would behave in these different models. So in MIMD, it's like we have many, and for the sake of drawing and fitting on a slide, I've made many equal to four, but just know that really many could be like dozens or hundreds or thousands of threads in reality. We have many threads that each are running independently. And you can see that because the height and where those threads started and ended on this slide differs. And this means that, say, across a multi-core CPU on different cores or in you know, a supercomputer across different nodes on that supercomputer, you could be running the same program, but it's not guaranteed that you're going to be at the same place in that program on one of those given processes. The pro to this approach is that it's very general. It supports things like thread level parallelism easily, and it doesn't require that all the threads reach a certain point at the same time. The downside, though, is because we are letting them run independently and not making those guarantees of letting things run together at the same time, that means we lose the efficiency of, say, only having to fetch the instruction once. So your performance or your energy might be worse in many cases. SIMD, or vector parallelism, is different in that instead of having many small threads, it's kind of like we have one big thread, which is what that arrow here is showing. Um, and because we have this one thread that's accessing a whole bunch of data in parallel, the pro is that we can usually take this approach and integrate it into existing AMD, X, Intel, x86, uh, you know, IBM, ARM, et cetera. They all have vector support in their CPUs, and that allows us to mix serial and vectorized or parallel code in the same CPU program. The con, though, is that when you need to communicate between the pieces of data in these threads, which, for example, doing things like gather and, scat gather and scatter, those implementations are going to be very complicated. And lastly, SIMT, excuse me. And lastly, SIMT, you can see that it's kind of a hybrid of these two approaches. So we have four threads, just like we did in MIMD or SPIMD, but now those threads are executing in lockstep, which are what those horizontal bars are showing. And we can see that all four threads are reaching the same point in this diagram at the same time. So that means that they're easier to program. It also means that we get those economies of scale, say only fetching an instruction once and using it across a bunch of threads, which means we can design more efficient communication between them for things like scatter and gather. But it also means that because they're explicitly designed around this idea that everything is executing concurrently, that performance really suffers as, as soon as that uh, requirement breaks. So as soon as those threads diverge and they're not doing the same thing at the same time, your performance on a GPU is really going to suffer. Any questions broadly about GPUs so far? Okay. So because GPUs are designed around this you know, computing paradigm, that means that we optimize them for the kinds of computations that frequently happen in programs like that. And it turns out that they have a lot of what we call streaming behavior, which means you bring the data in, you do some computations on it, and you send it back out. You're not reusing that computation over and over and over. Or if you are, you bring it into the register file or a specialized memory, unlike on a CPU. It also means that we can have different styles of main memory. Oftentimes, uh, although in the modern day this is changing a little bit, it takes hundreds of cycles to access main memory in GPU. Um, and that means because we have, uh, you know, we're not using out of order superscalar processing like in the CPU world, 
things are going to take a long time. Like we're going to have to wait hundreds of cycles for our thread to send a request out and get data back. And we need to do something to keep the device busy in the meantime. On a CPU, the way we solve this is largely caching. So we prefetch the data in ahead of time, or we bring it into the cache once and access it a whole bunch of times and exploit spatial and temporal locality. But like I just said, in these workloads that traditionally run on GPUs, they don't have a lot of reuse. So keeping it in the cache doesn't really help. We also, don't, like I alluded to a moment ago, we don't use other CPU techniques like out of order or dynamic scheduling, out of order processing or dynamic scheduling, because those techniques work well when you have instruction level parallelism to identify independent instructions. But the kinds of programs that traditionally run on GPUs don't have a lot of instruction level parallelism. And that means we added in a bunch of complexity that is going to hurt our power efficiency, but also not really give us huge wins. So the classic approaches that we take in the CPU world to fix this problem don't really work for GPUs. And thus we can turn to the one last way that we've tried to do this in the CPU world, which is that we throw more threads at the problem. And that is the one of technique of those ideas the CPU world has pursued that GPUs do heavily. So they use many, many threads, kind of like multi-threading, multi-core and SMT support in the CPU world, but this, this only works when we have independent threads. The nice thing though about GPUs, remember, with that SIMT model, we're assuming that each of those threads are independent. So that naturally aligns with the way that GPUs work. And thus, that's the trick here. So we're going to ha have thousands or millions of threads running concurrently on the GPU. And even if you send out a memory request and it takes a long time to come back, it's no big deal because I have you know 999,999 other threads that I can use to fill that delay while I'm waiting for the request to come back from memory. So I have lots and lots of <laughs> spare threads, so to speak, that are going to hide that delay for each other in the aggregate, and that allows us to get good performance. And so naturally, although I'm not really going to talk about it today, you can imagine that every time we run into one of these long latency operations in a GPU, we're going to switch which thread we're going to start executing instructions on. Because we know, since we're not able to exploit spatial and temporal locality, and really prefetching isn't going to help either, and we don't have ILP to reorder instructions, it's going to be gone for a while, right? It, it, we're going to have to wait a long time until that data comes back. And that's why GPUs are just going to go ahead and switch over and over and over every time we run into one of these operations. A little bit more detail about how this idea works. So we're, I mentioned we're going to have, say, millions of threads on a GPU. We're not actually going to have all million of them run as one big group. We're going to create smaller subgroups that we're going to group together and run on a core in the GPU. And we do this for efficiency. So the loose analogy here is that one SIMT thread group is roughly the same as a single CPU SIMT thread on the CPU. The difference though, is that these threads are explicitly exposed to the programmer, unlike with CPU SMT or hyper-threading support, where they're kind of hidden under the hood uh, by, the, by the OS. Uh, and because they're explicitly exposed to the programmer and because they're doing independent work, that means that we might execute different SIMD, SIMT thread groups simultaneously so you can have more than one group on a GPU core and we'll swap in between them as soon as we run into these long latency operations. And then we'll execute different SIMT thread groups on different GPU cores concurrently. And so you can imagine if we have millions of threads and we're letting many of them run on a core at a time, we're gonna get lots and lots of parallelism and lots and lots of concurrency. And that's really what GPUs thrive on. So let's start giving names to all these abstract concepts I've been talking about thus far. So a single one of those blue lines, little squiggly blue lines, is what CUDA and HIP. HIP is AMD's general purpose GPU programming language. CUDA is NVIDIA's general purpose GPU programming language. They call that a thread. OpenCL, which is another widely used uh, GPU programming language that is run by the Kronos group, uh, they call it a work item. The group of threads that we're ganging together in SIMT fashion and executing in lockstep 
which I showed as a group of four previously, hip and CUDA call that a warp, and OpenCL calls that a wavefront. And then executing multiple of those little groups together as a bigger thread group is what CUDA and HIP call a thread block or a CTA, and what OpenCL calls a work group. Naturally, because you have work items being grouped into work groups, that's where OpenCL's name comes from. And then finally, all of those groups of threads that are running on all of the GPU cores within the GPU at the same time, uh, CUDA and HIP call this a grid, and it's running in a kernel, and OpenCL calls that an ND range, and also calls the overall program or piece of the program that's running on the GPU a kernel. So naturally, now that we have some naming terminology out of the way, we're going to want to write programs. And I just mentioned CUDA, OpenCL, and HIP are uh, largely the most popular languages you might choose to do so with. All of them ultimately are extensions to C++. I like to think of them as writing C, C++ with some syntactic sugar on top of them to express these many threads and what's executing concurrently as a, a warp or a wave and what's executing concurrently as a work group. Um, and they're doing this by performing what we call a shader task, which is a snippet of scalar computation over many elements. And internally, GPUs will do this by adding support for things like scatter gather and vector mask operations. By the way, there are other solutions like Microsoft C++ AMP and OpenACC, which extends OpenMP for GPUs. Uh, you may also use those if you want, but I don't think they're supported in Gem5. Okay, so now just like we did some nomenclature on the, the software side, let's do the same on the GPU side. So on the GPU side, remember we have those cores, which I used in quotes thus far, and I said those cores will execute one or more thread block or work group on a given core at a time. Well, in reality, what GPUs refer to a core is what they call a compute unit, which are show, what's shown by that inner red rectangle. And within that inner red rectangle, you can see we have a bunch of registers, some local memory, an L1 cache bank, and some SIMT units. And what those SIMT units are, are essentially giant ALUs that are designed to execute the computation from a bunch of threads, a warp worth of threads or a wavefront worth of threads in parallel at the same time. And you can also see that within the GPU, we have other levels of memory. Maybe we have a shared L2 cache across all of those compute units and then main memory, which is nowadays usually HBM, but previously was GDDR um, on top of that. So this is the big picture view of what a GPU does. To give you a few more details within it, the compute unit, ultimately its job is to run those thread blocks or work groups, which means it has a bunch of SIMT units, which in the picture on the previous slide and on the right here are four. It doesn't have to be four. It can be some bigger or smaller number depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, but each cycle, the goal is that we're going to schedule one SIMT unit with one in, uh, group wave or warp of work. And that's what the SIMT units are doing. So they're running those wave fronts or warps, and the th specifically the threads within them. And how you size these SIMT units depends on the hardware and what you're trying to do. So in AMD GPUs, that size is N. For example, N could be 10 for what we call the wavefront instruction buffer, which essentially means the things that we are, the instructions that we're trying to execute on a given SIMT unit at a time. And we can say it'll take some number of cycles, like four to execute a single wavefront, um, with the goal being that we fetch and commit one wavefront per cycle. Now, because we have a whole bunch of threads in GPUs that are acts doing single instruction, multiple thread accesses. So each of those threads has unique data, but they're performing the same instruction. That means when we do something like a memory access that we're gonna generate a bunch of memory loads or stores depending on what we're trying to do. So for example, if we have a kernel that's trying to add to an, uh, arrays A and B and place the result in, a, in array C, each thread in our program might access one location in A, B, and C. So it'll read 
A at the address specified by its thread ID, read B at the address specified by its thread ID, add them together, and place that in C at the address specified by its thread ID. And such a pattern is actually really well suited for the GPU because it means that every thread is going to be accessing something four bytes away from the previous thread. So A plus zero might be index zero in this array, A plus four index one, A plus eight index two, and so on and so forth. And we can use this device you see on the right called the coalescer, which will observe, oh, hey, it turns out you're asking for all the same words on a cache line from word zero to word n minus one. So I'm just going to combine all those load restore re requests into one big request that asks for the entire cache line. And the coalescer's job is to, to reduce the number of memory requests as much as possible. So generate as few memory requests as I can for access, the accesses my kernel is doing. However, it's not guaranteed that we will have such nice access patterns. For example, what if array A, we access every other element? So we multiply by our thread ID by two. Well, in that case, then the elements in our array are actually gonna be A plus eight apart instead of A plus four. And so that means now we would have to issue two memory requests, one for N to N plus 16 times four, if it's a 16 word cache line, and then another one for n plus 16 times 4 to n plus 32 times 4. So because we're skipping over these elements, the coalescer is not able to combine those operations as easily, and that means that we have to issue more memory requests. So the upper example is the best case. That's what we try to do every time for the GPU, but the bottom case is what happens when that does not happen in our program. SIMT unit, similar, to, it's, you can think of it as being very similar to a wide CPU pipeline, except we're only doing it on one fetched instruction at a time. So that what I mean by that is, in the bottom here, you can see we have 16 different registers and 16 different ALUs above them that are being fed by those registers. Each of those 16 registers and ALUs are doing the same instruction at the same time. What's different is because they're each accessing a different bank of the register, they're going to be doing it on a different piece of data at that time. And because we're accessing so much stuff in parallel, that means that we need to have a much bigger register file than we do in CPUs. So to give a, some specifics here, for the AMD GPU architecture supported by Gem5, our ALU is 16 wide. It doesn't have to be 16 wide, though. It could be 8 or 32 or 64, whatever you decide to design your architecture to be but in Gem5, it's 16. Uh, and with the 64 kilobyte register state per SIMD unit, there are four SIMD units per CU in our Gem5 model. Um, ultimately, as you might've gathered from the last slide, getting good address coalescing, generating as few memory requests as possible by coalescing them together is key to getting good performance because it means that we avoid sending out n requests to the memory subsystem for n threads that are executing in parallel. Instead, we can have n over m, where m is the width of our wavefront or warp in the best cases. And just for reference, AMD's uh, wavefront is traditionally 64 wide, and NVIDIA's warps are typically 32 wide. Any questions thus far? Okay, so if we're doing all this coalescing and trying to avoid generating requests to the memory subsystem, like I said, in the worst case where we can't coalesce them, then it means that now we had say 32 threads that were generating 32 unique addresses on different cache lines that we have to load and store to. So you might be thinking, well, do I really wanna have 32 different load store ports on my L1 cache to enable this? Well, no, uh, that is not viable to design hardware with that many ports nowadays. Um, even if we were to bank the L1 cache, it still couldn't be banked enough to solve the problem. But, you know, ultimately, you might wonder then, well, if that's the case, then should I just let all 32 of them have their own cache miss and generate 32 requests to memory? And by the way, in AMD hardware, it's actually worse because it's 64 threads instead of 32. But again, as long as the common case is that we're accessing elements that are located nearby to one another, 
we're going to take advantage of address coalescing to avoid generating all these different requests. Um, so this is why it's really important. It reduces the number of in-flight memory requests, it helps DRAM bandwidth, and in general makes the performance better. So depending on AMD or NVIDIA, you have 32 to 64 memory requests per instruction. I just mentioned the common case is that they access the same cache block. If they don't, this is what we call divergence. Uh, and so that's why we try and avoid that as much as possible. I think my slides are a little repetitive, so I'm going to move forward. Um, next, because of this design, where we have many threads that are running concurrently, GPUs are what we refer to as throughput oriented. And that means, remember, we're going to assume that it's going to take hundreds of cycles when we issue memory requests for it to come back. Um, so we're going to have a lot of threads to hide that latency. CPUs are the opposite. They have relatively few threads, but they're going to try and prefetch, bring things into the cache, use instruction level parallelism, et cetera, so that you don't notice that that memory request is pending, or if it hits in the cache, just wasn't pending at all. With GPUs, our goal is to hide the latency of those accesses with the many in-flight threads, which means our memory subsystem has to handle a lot of overlapping requests. And in the worst case, where there's not enough threads to cover up the latency, well, then we might not have very good performance. You might think, well, caches could solve the problem, but keep in mind, even though um, you know GPU caches are relatively similar sized to CPU caches, we have lots of threads or work items sharing, say, an L1 data cache. And so that means, on average, we're only getting about six bytes of L1 cache space per thread, whereas in a two-threaded CPU system, each of them was getting 32 kilobytes. So there was a lot more data per thread we can store there. And even at the last level, where we have all the threads running across all the compute units fighting for space, or all the threads running across all the CPU cores fighting for space, on a CPU, you were getting like half a megabyte of space. But in a GPU, you're only getting a measly 25.6 bytes. So no matter what you do here, uh, GPUs are just not going to rely on caches in the same way that, that CPUs are. And so that means instead of trying to reduce the hit latency and make them return really fast, like a, C a CPU, GPU caches are designed to maximize throughput. So in part, this is because there's not much locality to exploit, uh, but also it's because we have all those threads we can use to hide stuff. So L1 cache will try and coalesce requests to the same cache block by different threads. And its goal is to keep that data, that line in the cache around long enough for all the threads in our warp or our wavefront to hit once. And basically its goal, that means its goal rather, is to reduce the number of requests we had to send to the DRAM. Likewise, the L2 cache is basically acting as a DRAM staging buffer. There might be a little bit of reuse, especially for the instruction cache here, but ultimately it's trying to tolerate spikes in DRAM bandwidth. And if you have a program that does have reuse, largely we're gonna try and use what the GPU calls specialized memory. So things like scratch pads, NVIDIA calls it shared memory, AMD calls it the local data store or LDS, um, or textures to exploit that kind of temporal locality. So I have about two more slides here before I hand off to, to Vishnu. But bef And since these slides are on a slightly different topic, are there any questions before I switch gears? OK. So those last two slides are, I want to talk about how these systems look like when it comes to modeling a GPU. And broadly, there's two kinds of GPUs. First, we have what we call an APU, or an accelerated processor unit. The reason we call it this is because in such a system, the CPU and the GPU have a single unified address space with coherent caches and virtual memory. And you don't need to make copies between the CPU and the GPU. You have one array that's accessed everywhere, or one data structure that's accessed everywhere. And the uh, by the way, AMD uses some um, different naming for this. So TCP is an L1 data cache. SQC is L1 I cache. TCC is the unified L2 cache. But you can see that what we have here is a number of compute units, in this case, four, shown in orange. Every four compute units are sharing an L1 I cache, but they have their each have their independent L1 data cache. And then they share an L2 cache beyond that. They also share 
a scalar cache, which is used for operations where you're doing the exact same thing on every thread, say loading the base address of an array. So instead of loading that for every thread and putting it into the vector register file and taking up a whole bunch of space, you can load it once in a scalar cache and use it for everything. And then on the CPU side, we have our CPU caches that are connected to the CPU, L1 data cache, shared L2, but we connect from the CPU's L2 and the GPU's L2 directly to the directory, which will then go on to memory. And this allows us to have a sync. You can see we have a single address space. They communicate past the L2 with each other. And thus, if we want to move data back and forth, the directory can go to either the CPU or the GPU and do so. This is contrasted with what we call DGPUs or discrete GPUs. And the reason we call discrete GPUs discrete is because in this scenario, the CPU and the GPU have discrete address spaces that are separate from one another. So the GPU will have its own virtual memory, GPU VM. It'll have special DMA engines, SDMAs, packet processors, et cetera, whose job is to essentially bypass and ignore, uh, communicate with the host. Uh, and we also have a interrupt handler, which is all of these things are shown in purple. And what those things are doing now is they're at, at uh, excuse me, at, at, let me try one last time, acting as the interface between the CPU and the GPU, usually across something like NVLink, XGMI, or PCIe. So now we have this extra interface, but we get our own private or unique address spaces. And you can see in this situation that the GPU is connected to its own special memory in the bottom left of the slide. And likewise, the CPU is connected to its own main memory in the bottom right of the slide. So because they have their own separate address spaces, if we want to pass data back and forth between them, we have to explicitly copy data from the CPU to the GPU. Whereas in the APU, we just went to wherever in the system had that data and brought it to us. GEM5 supports both APUs and DGPUs, and Matt and Vishnu in the next you know, section will talk about some of those differences and where the code is. But I did just want to make sure that if you hear us talk about APUs versus DGPUs, that you understand the difference is basically where can the data be accessed and who does the accessing. And with that, we're done with uh, a brief tour. So for those of you who are caught up while Vishnu is helping him uh, you know, get things up and running, you should be able to go ahead and start running the commands that you see here. Um, the first one where you build the M5Ops, I don't think we talked explicitly about M5Ops thus far in the tutorial, but what M5Ops allow you to do is they allow you to essentially label regions of interest in your program. So you can specify like, this is where the program, the part that I care about begins. So I don't really care about the stats before here, or this is where the stats end, or I want to reset the stats here because maybe I had like a big phase that I care about running and I want stats specifically for that region, etc. cetera. So um, that's why we're using M5Ops here is it allows us to delineate those important regions in our program, which basically all modern, you know, common programs are running. So that's what these first two commands here are going to do. And then the second commands, two commands, which, by the way, these should all take, I don't know, less than two minutes. Um, I would expect that what it does is it's going to recompile our square benchmark, but does now have it run for MI300. And... Instead of GFX 902, like we saw in the previous experiment we ran. Another way of saying that is MI300 has a different a different target that we compile for other than GFX902, in part because it's a discrete GPU, but also because it's just fundamentally a different GPU. Right, it just fundamentally has a different target that we're gonna compile the code for. 
So uh, go ahead and I'll circle around and help people as needed with those. Or maybe I'll have Matt do that while I try to get a new battery for the for the microphone here. But hopefully these commands should take you know less than one or two minutes because they're all just compiling benchmarks and things like that. And then the fourth one which I've been here for the parallel work which came out on the same day as our work and which also came out of the same class that we've done. The history is here, but the interesting part of the history is like they all run the command here. Like they run square time. But it doesn't really mean that they're trying to keep the ads. Voilà, voilà, si. Hello. Does this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so assuming you've all run square, uh, yeah, like I've been saying before, you don't need the Docker over here. All you need is a disk image, the kernel file, and whatever application that you want to run. That's been compiled for an MI300. Yeah. So when you run this big command, what it does is it takes the application binary, embeds it into the disk image, loads the disk image onto your system, and it runs the binary from inside. So you can technically also run any script that has executable permissions here. All it, The app just needs to be an executable. It doesn't really need to be a binary. It can be a script, a binary. Yeah, it just needs to be have execute permissions and it works. And if you finish running this, you should be able to see the console output in M5 out. You'd also notice that the output that it prints on screen is slightly different to what you saw in SE mode. That's also because all the CPU's outputs are not on screen. It's redirected to a file and it should be there in system.pc.com underscore one dot device. If you open that file, you should be, you should see a line at the end that says square passed, running square, setting up OS, booting OS. You should see all those five lines over there. So yeah. And any other application that you want to run in FS mode, you recompile it and launch it here.
sometimes these applications can be very time consuming. If you have huge training iterations, it could take days or weeks to run, depending on how large your program is. Square is a very simple, small application that is only used to, you know, ju is just to used to check if things work fine, but it doesn't really serve any practical purpose. So any practical application that you run would end up making you wait for a long time for the result. So one way you can get around this is you can use this concept called checkpointing is effectively you run the application up to a certain state, you save the state of the application and in subsequent runs, you just restore it. Just like how you play a game and save the state and load the save again, you just load the checkpoint and run the rest of the application. This is essentially useful if all your kernel, like if your application has several kernel iterations where each kernel is doing the same thing, you don't want to do it a thousand times. You only want to do it 10 times. So you run it 90 times, 80 times, save it, and then run the rest for your subsequent experiments. So this ends up saving you a lot of time without degrading the quality of your stats. So the stats that you get for the 10 kernels that you actually run would still be very accurate. And you need to modify your application binary application to enable checkpointing. So uh, I'm not sure if this is exactly visible. I'll probably open the binary over here itself. So I've already made these changes beforehand and put it in a directory here. I'll open that and point you through and walk you through all the changes you need to make. So, yeah, you don't need to worry about what the application does. The only things you'd need to change are you'd need to include the M5 ops and an M5 MMAP include file. We'll see in a while why these are needed. And when you start your app, when you, like when your application starts in main, wherever, wherever in just before you call a checkpoint, you need to do these two things. You need to set this global variable called m 5 op addr to this very specific magic address. And you need to call this map m 5 m command. What these do is essentially all, the, all your M5 ops are instructions that your CPU runs. But by default, the OS that you loaded does not know what those instructions mean. So you're essentially telling it to go look up this address and you're mapping your you're kind of mapping those instructions onto your disk memory and you're redirecting all your M5 ops to a binary there to go execute these actual M5 instructions. You need M5 instructions to dump stats, to you know start certain counters, to do various things that you'd need for analysis. And the steps that I've shown so far are the same regardless of what application you want to run. And then you also call this M5 checkpoint underscore ADDR function. So the zero comma zero in its arguments mean that you want to take a checkpoint zero cycles after the instructions executed. And the second argument here tells you the period after which it should take the next checkpoint. If you set it to a non-zero value, it takes a checkpoint every n, n cycles. Here we don't want, we, do, we only want a single checkpoint. So we set it to zero. So with these five changes, any application you have should be ready to ready for checkpointing. And since I've already, since I already have this file stored, you, we can just start. Yeah, we can just start running these commands, uh, starting from this one over here. We copy the updated square into gem file resources where the original square resides. We're essentially swapping the files out. And yeah. And once you have done that, we also update the MI300 run script because the original run script does not support checkpointing inside an application. So I've made small changes to the MI300 file to do this. We replace the existing MI300 file with this modified one. And once you've done that, we need to go rebuild square. 
now that the binary is changed, we need to go rebuild square. So we go into the square directory. And we clean the existing build and rebuild again. Oh, yeah. Is anyone facing problems here or is, is everything smooth? Oh yeah, I haven't built M5 either. Yeah. Asking how big the checkpoints will be. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. I don't remember the exact size, but we'll see that in a moment. It takes I mean, a few minutes. The system size, the application size. And it, the right. Yeah. It depends on how long your application has run. So yeah. essentially, you're checking. How much state yeah. You have yeah. It's essentially a safe of everything that resides in the GPU at that point. Any, any, task that's pending in those hardware queues, anything in the cache, anything being executed, anything, any st any state anywhere is all stored. Entire DRAM contents, everything stored. So it depends on how much memory have you used up. It depends on how much, how many packets the CPU has issued to the GPU, how much is executed, how much is not executed. Um, the setting, setting for the I think it's just the cells that are altered and it's a compressed file. But it's a it's still a huge file depending on again how long it's run. Yeah. That's okay, thank you. but the trade-off is that you save a lot of time running stuff. So yeah, since now I've built scones and yeah, my square should build now. Yes, it's built. So yeah, assuming everyone's reached this stage, let's now go back to our favorite gem5 bootcamp environment directory and run this big command here. So essentially what this command is doing is it's doing the same thing that you use when you ran square before, except for this one extra param parameter called the checkpoint directory. What that does is it stores whatever checkpoint you create in the directory you provide. You don't have to provide M5 out. You can use a directory of your choice, but I'm just going to go ahead with M5 out for now. Okay. Should I go over there? Or is it... So yeah, assuming all of you are running this, we should see a print saying writing checkpoint anytime now. So what this modified square does is it has one kernel launch. We take a checkpoint before the kernel launch when all the initialization phase has happened. OS boot, once OS is booted up, once memory is initialized, once memory is moved, when, once data is moved to the GPU, once all these initialization tasks are done, we write a checkpoint. And in later simulations, we don't need to go through the process of rebooting a GPU anymore. We just start, pick off from where we left. So as the checkpoint is being created, you would also be able to see this file called m5.cpt in whatever directory you use for the checkpoint. In my case, I used M5 out from a checkpoint directory. So there is this M5.cpt file created, which contains everything you need to know about the CPU state at that point. More interestingly, it, I think somewhere down below, must contain information about all the packets, the size packets, like queue sizes.
okay yeah since kernel offload hasn't since no kernels have been executed so far there's nothing there are no packets in the system so all those fields are empty but if you checkpointed an application after a few kernel runs you'd see kernel information stored here let's wait some more time for the checkpoint to finish and we'll begin restoring it In the meantime, I'll also, if you haven't looked at it already, I can also show you what the console output looks like. This shows you all the steps that the OS boot went through. And somewhere later, you'd see the login prompt and various other OS, OS stuff. And you all, you'll also see a line that says it's running square. And if, if we were not taking a checkpoint, you'd also see the output of square print show up over here. So my checkpoint is completely written. If all of you are at the same stage, we'll move on to the restoration. Square over here is just a toy example. Any benchmark suite you run, any complex scientific computing workload or machine learning workload, same applies to those. You can do all your initializations, first few iterations of loops, take a checkpoint, and subsequent runs just run what you want to run. Yes, you'd need to use the same microarchitecture. If you change your source code, actually, no, you'd need the same microarchitecture because you store the state of each buffer in your system. So if anything changes there, your checkpoint is not going to work anymore. But if I use a warm up state, so when you restore, you are warming up all these things that previously exist. I mean, are you saying that in the new microarchitecture where you want to restore, it's essentially a subset of your older microarchitecture? So you're not replaying most of it, right? What you're doing is you're just taking a snapshot of the CPU at that point. There is the notion, the question of so many work groups have completed or so many kernels have completed is not a very, it's not a, it's not a question that you ask because it's just a snapshot of the system. There's no, you're not capturing history. You're just capturing a snapshot. Yeah. Because yeah, if you, for example, in your new microarchitecture, you might not have the same number of hardware queue entries. They might not have the same capabilities in a particular queue. And it might fail when you. Uh, not I don't I don't believe that's possible at the moment. I'm just I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's possible, but the other record I believe they have the exact same states and views and streams and whatever. But if it didn't, then can I have you sure, sure. So one other caveat is that when you restore, you shouldn't be changing the application binary itself because then you're right. I mean, I didn't catch all of what you two were talking about, but one thing I just wanted to add, if you're worried about warming up like after the checkpoint to like restore cache state or something, I mean, you have two choices. So one, you know, the checkpoint is going to restore the memory state up to a certain point. I think it restores the L2. Do you remember? Well, so I'm going to answer this like GP specifically, but 
generally we're checkpointing in between kernels yes. and in most cases your l1 is going to be either yeah. empty or irrelevant is it'll so, always be true yeah that's yeah. always true yeah. and then the l2 cache um, it sort of depends on the application. You can choose whether or not to keep it. That's sort of one of the features of a GPU, right? Is you can choose whether or not you want to keep the L2 persistent in between kernels. I don't know if that's checkpointed. I think it is. Okay. So, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is. Yeah, I think so too, because I remember we spent a lot of time getting that to work. Actually. Yes, so <laughs> that's exactly what it, it will replay and place everything back in the cache. Um, so I think sort of what you're getting at is, you know, what is the use case here? Like what parameters can we change when we restore the checkpoint? I think cache hierarchy is one of the things that you can modify. So there is some support that uh, one of Bargav, one of David Reddy's students has added to do ARM CPU checkpointing with QMU and NGM5. I have never tried it. Vishnu has tried it. He might know a little bit more than I do, but that's the state of the art for Gem 5 CPU checkpoints. Yeah, for uh, discrete GPU full system specifically, right now, uh, when we mentioned we only support KVM and Atomic, so those bypass the cache completely. So there's nothing to checkpoint in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just mention. So you can simulate integrated programs with CPUs and GPUs, but right now you can't do that in GPUFS, right? Right now, GPUFS only supports the two CPUs that Matt just mentioned. So if you want to run a program like that, we do not yet have like O3 CPU integration. We're, we're working on it. it. It'll come, but we don't have exactly what you want yet. Right now, we have it where you have functional only CPU and timing you know, GPU with full system you know, PyTorch support. We don't have function, sorry, sorry uh, timing CPU and GPU with PyTorch support, which I think is what you're asking. Yeah, no, it's just not quite there. Um, I can help them, Vishnu, if you want to keep moving. Thank you. Right. So once this checkpoint's been created, to restore, all you need to do is bring up the same old command and do run restore there. I yeah, just noticed that yeah, when, when I was debugging that, I just noticed that there's a typo in the command. It needs to use MI300 because MI, the MI200 script does not have the fix you need for checkpointing. I don't know why this typo crept in, but yeah, you'd need to change this to MI300. And And when you run this, it should restore the directory. Sorry, restore the checkpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you're saying this line, instead of looking copy from the readme, has to be in MI300. MI300, yes. And that's the only change. That's the only change. This is because these scripts by default do not support checkpointing inside an application. I'd modified the MI300 to do this and we copied that into our repo, but yeah, for some reason, the checkpoint and restore command didn't list that. Uh, this is from Gemfi Bootcamp in Manhattan. You shouldn't be there. You'd, you'd need to be there to build Square, but you need to be in Gem 5 Bootcamp environment to run this. I mean, technically, you can be in any command, any directory, you just need to change the parts accordingly. But for the parts in the readme to make sense, you need to be there.
everybody has a problem right now. This is, yeah, probably, yeah, this is, yeah, this is because of the MI200, MI300 script difference. Well, he's saying he's getting another MI300. Just probably because you created the checkpoint with, you created. Yeah, it needs to be MI300 for both. I'm sorry about that. No, it's not the same. Yeah, it's, yeah. So if you're getting the error that the agent just had, which says like empty message and no parameters, you need to go back and create the checkpoint for MI300 instead of 200, and then restore it from 300 as well. And the only reason we do this is because these scripts, the default scripts do not allow to, to checkpoint within an application. Oh. You wanna move forward? I mean, if people want to run that parallel, and if you want to talk to your slides, you could do that. This is the last one. How much longer do you because otherwise, if it's just like having a lot of product, we can go to that part. Yeah. But, uh, it should write a checkpoint in maybe a minute or two. I mean, well, we have 20 minutes, yeah. So I guess the only interesting thing to show is once you, once you restore, you can look at the console output and see just one line saying past. You don't see the system boot, but that's something you can do offline. So, how much longer do you think it takes? Two minutes, roughly two minutes to get the checkpoint and yeah, and then around two, three minutes for us to. So we. Why don't we, they, they yeah, know it's yeah, to, yeah. Why don't we let them run that, that search? Right. And if you see any others, just let me know. Yeah, uh, make sure you stop through.